Good evening, everybody, and welcome to this webinar on um, a very interesting uh, story about Ned Kelly and uh, how the story has been distorted over the years and what the reality actually is. I'm Adrian Froggart, District Governor of 9820, and uh, I warmly welcome you to this uh, webinar. Leo Kennedy was going to be one of our key speakers at our conference which of course, thanks to COVID-19, never occurred. Leo's been a friend of mine for the best part of 20 years since uh, Wendy and I moved across from New Zealand to Australia to uh, probably have an effect as uh, was so eloquently put by a past Prime Minister of New Zealand, uh, Sir Robert Muldoon, or often known as Piggy Muldoon, who said that uh, as people move across from New Zealand to Australia and immigrate, it raises the IQ of both countries. Now, I'm not sure whether to be offended by that or, or not, but however, I have to say that I've loved being in Australia. And one of the things I've loved is, uh, is, is becoming friends with Leo and getting to know a little bit about the story of uh, his family and the Kelly family and the interconnection between the two and how the history has kind of been perverted over time. So uh, Leo has a very important story to tell. So it's my absolute pleasure and privilege to introduce to you Leo Kennedy, who's going to talk about uh, Black Snake, the real story of Ned Kelly. Over to you, Leo. Thank you, Adrian. And uh, thank you everyone for this opportunity to talk to you about a story that uh, has a lot of uh, deep, I suppose, meaning and feeling within my family uh, and also with other families that I know that actually include descendants of the Kelly family and the Lloyd family. And this story started pretty much for me for as long as I can remember. So this story begins with my grandfather, Jimmy. And he had the saddest eyes I'd ever seen. And as a young boy, I could never understand why. When I came into the room, his face would light up like a Christmas tree. And he'd say, g'day young fella, how are you going? And wave his walking stick at me. But within an instant, this veil of sadness came back down over his face. And for many years, I could not work out why and it was only gradually over time I put the pieces together. One of those pieces was at age seven when I was surrounded by the older kids at school and they were saying, you know Ned Kelly, Leo, you know. Leo did not know because my family had done a very good job at protecting me from Ned Kelly. And I guess the pain and sadness they'd been through. But what was that pain and sadness? I didn't know for even more years until really I got to high school when I found out people actually thought Ned was some kind of a hero because he'd fought the cops. It's the first time I'd experienced people thinking cops were the bad guys because I'd grown up knowing about the goodness in police, not what others had grown up with, which was 110 books about Ned, over 10 movies, and even now an opera. And Ned being all kinds of things as topics came up. In the 60s and 70s, he was apparently going to set up a republic. But the fact is, it was just a story told by Lloyd to get rid of some very annoying writers. They were fooled and unfortunately they fooled a lot of other people. Ian Jones was describing the Stringing Bark Police as a death squad. More on that one later. And Ned, who proudly described himself as a colonial and mocked the Irish, was apparently leading the Irish in a fight against the English. All these stories, all these things made up, it just made me more and more determined to get to what was the real story of these policemen, my, starting with Michael Kennedy, with others at the, at the time, and also what was the real Ned Kelly? He certainly didn't stand up for the rights of small farmers. 
he bragged that he'd stolen over 280 horses, and a lot of those were from his, even from his near neighbours, who were just as poor as the Kellys. So when it gets to robbing from the rich, as it says on the tourist trail and giving to the poor, he took from whoever had what he wanted and used it how he liked. Let's go back a little bit. I said I grew up with the stories of Michael Kennedy. The ex he was an exemplary policeman. Uh, I read his record, I took the punt and got it off the police. I didn't know what I would find after all the things I'd read in the Ned books, but I was astounded. The things I was told by my father and my grandfather were all true. He was indeed an exemplary policeman. Award after award after award and commendations. Courageous, zealous, putting himself at personal risk. I'll give you just one or a couple of stories out of it. That gold watch you see, that was awarded to him for his part in the capture with Michael Scanlon of the Donnelly brothers and Michael successfully prosecuted them. At the time, they were the most notorious horse and cattle thieves in the colony of Victoria. The people around Dune were so happy about that. And you can see it, the numbers there on screen. They gave him a gratuity of 56 pounds, 16 shillings and sixpence, a year's salary for getting rid of the Donnelly brothers so they could get on with the business of farming. He was perhaps an exception in a police force that was put together very hastily in a growing colony. No proper training because Standish couldn't be bothered paying for training for policemen. He thought they could learn on the job. And only 50% were like Michael. They'd had previous experience. And of this population of police, this 1,100 police, 80% were Irish and coming from backgrounds like Michael. Farming backgrounds, working hard as labourers before they got their chance in the Dublin Constabulary or the Irish Constabulary. And then seeing their chance to come to a colony such as Victoria, where they could actually own land, something they could not do in their own country. So he took advantage of the opportunities within Victoria. But then think about Ned and Ned's story. Whereas Michael's parents were poor, they were honest. They were God-fearing and they were sober. Now let's talk about Ned. Ned unfortunately was born into a family where thieving was seen as an occupation and a career. His uncles on his mother's side were into horse theft and brawling and the same on the Kelly side. These were his male role models. His own father had drunk himself to death by the time Ned was 11. Ned's schooling started at six and ended at age eight and he basically became a truant who disappeared off down to the local Cobb and Co, borrowed a horse or stole it we should say rode it for half a day so that when the Cobb and Co came in, they didn't have four good horses to change over to, only three. By age 12, he'd done a, a very good thing. He rescued a boy that was stuck in a boggy billabong at the bottom of a, a creek near Avenal and was awarded a green sash. Some writers exaggerate that story and talk about a flooded creek and his lungs bursting for oxygen. No, it didn't happen because it was the third year of a drought. It was a boggy billabong. But still, Ned did a good thing. But here is where I see him conflicted. What does he do about a month later? He's caught in Glenburn, 50 miles from home, on a stolen horse. And as well as his green sa sash, he's got a blue warrant to go with it for horse theft. That's at age 12. The warrant lapsed because they, they left and moved up to Greta. Ellen picked up her family and moved up to her two sisters into a broken down, once was a hotel, where there were now three families living together under the same roof with a brood of about 15 kids. But they had problems. Again, there were no males around, but both the Lloyd uh, parents, the males were in jail. That left three women to try and fend for themselves and this brood of kids. And unfortunately, Ned's uncle Jim, when he wasn't in the uh, 
lunatic asylum up at Beechworth, he was causing trouble. This night, he comes into their house and wants his way with first Alan and then her sisters and is chased off by Alan with a broom through the local bar. Midnight, he burns the place down and you have 15 homeless kids and three women. And Alan is, makes, buys the only selection in the area that has a shanty on it so that she has a roof over her kids' heads. Ned Kelly's life as a boy was tough. He didn't make a lot of decisions for himself and he didn't have great role models. But what do you do with a boy like that? Alan had the answer. You apprentice him to a bush ranger for goodness sake. Not to a carpenter, not to a stonemason, a bush ranger. So Ned was the apprentice to Harry Power, who was hiding out near Ned's maternal grandfather, Quinn's squat up at the head of the king. And from there, he had an acrimonious relationship with Power. He came home, he was caught by the police and persuaded over a couple of months to hand Power in. And he actually gave away Power. I found the document from Sergeant Babington that describes him as the one who gave away Power. When he, after he'd given away power, he was looked down upon by his clan and his group. You can see here one of the few examples of Ned's handwriting at age 14. Everyone looks on me like, and then the English doesn't get, get that great, a black snake. Now the next part's the most interesting part of this. Send me an answer as soon as possible. He was pleading with the police to get him out of the situation he was in. He wanted a different life, but his mother said no and wouldn't let him go to the sheep station he was promised a job in in New South Wales. He had to stay and to survive, he had to become meaner and tougher and harder than anyone else. And unfortunately, he did. Ned spiralled from being Power's pup into joining it with the greeter mob and look at that itinerary over 10 years. He was committed a number of assaults. He belted up a Chinese traveling salesman called Ah Fook. He stirrup whipped a couple that were also traveling salesmen that got into dispute with a, a friend of the Kellys. Eventually, after riding with the greeter mob and stealing numerous horse and cattle, he was done for receiving a horse from Wild Wright and after six months in remand, spent two and a half years in jail. He did not learn. When he got out, he got straight back into horse thieving. He did actually at one point put in the paperwork for a selection, but he never put the money with it and it never went ahead. He was too busy making fast money by stealing other people's horses and cattle up in New South Wales and then blowing the money, gambling and drinking and carousing on the way back. The other thing that changed when he did get back out of jail after three years was his mother had taken another lover that she eventually married called George King. King was running the horse thieving operation and Ned was second. But the story goes that after one, yet, yet another argument between the two and King giving his mother yet another hiding Ned and King rode off and only one came back, Ned. And King was never mentioned again and the standover man of King Baron also disappeared. Ned was in charge and with the, with the governor off of King there to control things, Ned went wild. The raids became audacious. In one raid, his group, the greeter mob, stole 11 horses, adjusted horses on Whitty's property. A couple of months later, they stole another five horses from their near neighbours, fellow selectors, farmers doing it hard on the same type of land as them. He stole from among his own. But the police were onto it. And with the assistance between New South Wales Police and Victorian Police, they broke this gang apart. They arrested the Baumgarten brothers that was a holding place at the border and they arrested a couple of the greeter mob. 
And I should say at this point, Ned's horse thieving didn't always go the way he planned. One of his raids was on a squatter who had a foreman called Graves. And when Ned handed over the false paperwork, Graves didn't believe it and told Ned to get on his way. Ned objected and Graves gave him the hiding of his life. So this man touted by Ian Jones as some superb boxer and fighter, copped an absolute hiding. So it's just another demonstration of, in some of the books that are written, it's not always exactly as it's written. Ned did not always win. Ned did not always come first. And Ned was not the victim he's been painted by so many others. At this point, the Kelly brothers went into hiding, but they were still active. When Heach impounded a couple of Kelly stray horses that had wandered into his crop, Ned retaliated by burning his shed of oats. The man lost 300 pounds worth of oats. And he put up a 50 pound reward and no one was, would dare speak against Ned. And there were good reasons for that. If you look there, at February 1878, Pat Quinn quoting Ned, I will kill any man who interferes with me. At this stage, the Kellys had got guns and they were not going to go to jail. It was that early, way earlier than when Constable Fitzpatrick got clever and realized that just after Ellen had given birth to Fitzpatrick, to King's Child that eventually Dan, Dan and Ned would come home for a visit. Fitzpatrick came off second best and was wounded when Ned burst through the door and shot him through the wrist. And again, the Kelly brothers did not turn themselves in. Even though they had warrants for horse theft against them, they took off into the bush and left their mother and others to deal with the consequences. The trials were run in two sets, the, the Baumgarten trials, I'll call them, and the Fitzpatrick affair trials. They, the two trials concluded on the 8th and the 10th of October with Ned's mother receiving three years jail and the other two charged with uh, attempt, accessories to attempted murder receiving six years each. Of the Baumgarten trials, the greeter mob boys both received six years and one of the Baumgartens four years. The Kelly brothers knew the kinds of sentences they would receive when they were eventually captured. They were not coming in, they were hidden at Bullock Creek and they were practicing their aim. When eventually their hideout was found, there was a cluster of trees there with targets on them that had been heavily used. But the police were embarrassed by these trials and particularly Ned being used as the defense of the Baumgartens and the Greta mob, that he was the guilty party, not them. The papers were having a field day with the police. So the cry went out to apprehend the Kellys and two parties were sent out, one from Greta and one from Mansfield to search Powers old hideout at the head of the King. Preparations were hasty. And for example, in Mansfield, you had four police, none of whom had any practice in really using any firearms at all. And one of them didn't have, a, didn't have a, a pistol and had to borrow one. They didn't have enough food, so they borrowed the Reverend's old shotgun to bag a feed. And when the stagecoach came in, they borrowed the rifle off it as they'd heard the Kellys had armed up. But the problem there was, none of them knew how to use the rifle. So that is your death squad, according to Ian Jones, an underprepared team of four. And Stringy Bar Creek was their first point as a pathway stop before they got to the head of the King. The problem was when they left on that morning of 25 October, Walter Lynch, an associate of the Kellys, and sometimes mailmen for the Wombat area out near Stringybark Creek saw them leave, 
checked the police paddocks, found out a bit more information in town, and then rode out by another route to Bullock Creek and tipped off the Kellys. They knew these four policemen were coming. It was just a matter of time. So the next day, after checking out the campsite at around midday, they then attacked at 5 p.m. Thomas Lonigan was on one side of a fire and McIntyre had his back to the Kelly gang when they approached and said bail up. Lonigan front on saw them coming, turned to run and reached down for his revolver as he turned. Ned immediately fired and he was dead within three or four steps as he collapsed on the ground. He'd copped a fleck along the side of his temple, a fragment of a bullet through his left hand side of his right eye, went behind his nose and pierced his brain and he fell down dead. That did not explain the other wounds found on his body after death. It would appear when they left later, the Kellys used him for target practice again and fired additional rounds into his body. That was the first ambush. Thomas McIntyre was captured and told to have the other two police surrendered. But when they returned and he approached Sergeant Kennedy, the sergeant thought he was joking and put his hand on his hip. What's on his hip? His revolver. Again, Ned fires. This time he misses and Michael Kennedy slides backwards off his horse and hits the ground and drops his revolver. Thomas McIntyre sees Kennedy Liney on the ground and Michael Scanlon trying to alight from his horse, being hit by three rounds from the other members of the Kelly gang, then Ned running forward and shooting him in the chest and killing him. McIntyre escapes on Kennedy's horse and then Michael Kennedy is left on foot to try and outrun four outlaws. He was wounded twice in that chase according to one version, three times in another. But they caught up with him. They couldn't find McIntyre. They held my great grandfather for two hours and then they shot him through the heart. And according to Dr. Reynolds evidence, my great grandfather was standing up, able to survive, I would say, when he was assassinated. But they didn't stop there. They pulled the ring off his finger. They took his gold watch. They emptied out his pockets of the coins he had. And they did the same to Michael Scanlon and Thomas Lonigan. And they were outlawed. Again, they refused to surrender to police. And they conducted an 18 month reign of terror over Victoria. A couple of months later, they did a raid of Faithful Creek at the Young Husband Station, and they rounded up people and kept them in a barn for about 48 hours, then rode into the nearby town of Euroa in the afternoon when a funeral was being conducted and robbed the bank of about 2,000 pounds, and then made off, and then lived off that money and paid off people for their silence for a number of months. Hearing that New South Wales bragged they would capture the Kellys if they came over the border, they were audacious again and staged a raid on Geraldry, riding in, taking over the town for three days, taking over 60 people hostage. Again, a robbery of over 2,000 pounds and released the second version of their manifesto after the Cameron letter. They released what is called the Geraldry letter which had more rhetoric and more threats. Beware your trains and promising a colonial stratagem. A couple of words they'd borrowed out of a newspaper and thought sounded good, so they used them as well. And then they stayed hidden and spent down that 2,000 pounds and wrote letters to the police that were after them threatening death and all manner of harm to them 
and paying visits to those among their sympathisers who they'd heard were giving information to the police and threatening them back into line. Around May, in March, March and May in 1880, thefts of plough board, mole, mole boards, plough mole boards started to be reported to police and whispers of something grand happening, something that would make Victoria sit up and take notice. This was the rumour of the colonial stratagem. It was supposed to be in five parts, murder Sherrett to attract the police up because they were in fear of the what they call back in those days the black trackers from Queensland, Aboriginal trackers, that Ned despised. He wanted them dead and he wanted as many police dead as possible. The plan was to derail the train after it pulled out of the station of Glen Rowan and came around a bend and toppled down the side. That didn't happen. The other parts were to ride into Benalla, attack the police garrison there, rob the bank in Benalla and then disappear back up into the hills. None of that went to plan. And the biggest flaw, what has become perhaps the most iconic part of Ned Kelly, the armour. They tested it by firing against it, but they never actually wore it before they got to Glen Rowan and put it on that evening when the police arrived. They couldn't see out the visors. They could not use their weapons or aim their weapons effectively. And the two smaller outlaws, it was too heavy for them to move. They were sitting there like two cans of petrol, waiting to be shot apart. And whilst the latest movie has them elegantly dressed in dresses as well as armour, and the inn on fire before they're deceased, that wasn't the way it went down. After an exchange that lasted a whole 10 minutes, Ned got angry burst out the back door because the police hadn't surrounded the inn and went and laid down in a copse of trees nearby and basically slept there till morning, probably affected by the amount of alcohol they had all drunk over the last two or three days while at Glen Rowan. The other three remained in there still toasting the Kelly gang and firing the odd angry shot out in the midst of 60 odd hostages, men, women and children inside a timber inn. Four hostages died from stray bullets from the police, although it's argued one of them actually died by having an argument with one of the gang and being shot. Again, there's plenty of double stories in this. Ned wasn't the only one who gave more than one version of events. But the gang was trapped by their armour. 5 a.m. in the morning, Byrne was dead and Ned didn't know. Ned burst out of the copse of trees at sunrise and tried to attack the police. But by that stage, he no longer had a right arm that would work at all. He was shooting with his left hand and he was brought to the ground by shots through his legs and captured. The other two didn't come out. They stayed inside the inn and refused to budge. They let the other hostages go at 9 and 10 a.m. in the morning and still fired shots out at the police until at one o'clock there were two shots and then silence. The police did not want to risk any more life so they waited until three and then they strangely and oddly and inexplicably they set fire to the inn and it burnt their corpses. The gang was destroyed, but there was so much aftermath from that. Ned was convicted and hanged of the murder of Lonigan. He was never tried for the murder of Scanlon, and he was never tried for the murder of Sergeant Kennedy. But what were we left with after that? We had a Royal Commission, and out of that Royal Commission, there were many findings about how the police were not um, armed enough, not trained enough, did not have great equipment, 
and their whole structure was poorly managed. And of the, the Commission unfortunately did not address the underlying issues that led to this outbreak. And Ned, Ned started to be used. The anti-capital punishment lobby used him as their figurehead and tried to gather signatures, not as Ian Jones claimed to free him, but only to spare the life of the condemned man. Let him pay for his crime by spending the rest of his life in jail. That is what the reprieve was about. But as I said, people started to use Ned's name and they started to use his image. The papers had lived off his story for the last two years and they kept on rerunning it week after week. It was, it was, uh, it had all those elements to it. It had awe, it had gore, and it had so much to it. And when the movie started, Ned was painted as the victim. He did, of course, yes, he certainly had a very poor early life, but at certain points when he did make decisions, he did not take the ones to turn his life around. He kept going on that criminal spiral. So the real victims, those 280 plus at least farm owners, the people he committed assaults on, his stirrup whipping of Aboriginals, his bashing of the Chinese traveling salesmen, the hostages in those three locations, they were all forgotten because it was all about victim Ned. And my family and the Lonigan family were forgotten too. They were written out of the story, but they did it hard. My grandfather, Jimmy there, second from the left, was less than two years old when he lost his father. He grew up without a dad. He would have liked to have had a dad. He was taught to read and write after school by the new sergeant in Mansfield, not his sergeant, not his dad. And the challenge for us has been over time that so many people have been attracted and excited by this story. that They've decided to rewrite it, add new bits in, and I listed those off earlier on in this talk. None of it's true, but it's such a story with so many true tragic parts to it. Why not simply tell that true story? On the right hand side, you can see a movie stringy bark. I was approached by Tim Head and his dad to talk about who was Michael Kennedy and who were the four policemen because they felt that story had not been told truly. And they did a depiction of Stringy Bark Creek that is very accurate and very true of the police. A far better watch than the Kelly Gang rewrite by Kurzel. 2008 and nine, we pretty much lost a generation of Kennedys. And we went to Mansfield to remember them, but also get back to our roots. And when we went to the cemetery to visit that grave in the second picture there, half my family was in tears because instead of being able to peacefully visit our family grave, we were confronted by a Ned Kelly tourism sign as big as your front door, inviting people to come and look at the three graves of policemen associated with the Kelly gang. I put it to you, you do not become associated with someone by being murdered by him. That sign was gone within half an hour of the Shire officers opening on Monday. But why was it ever there? Why was our story, why was our family, monuments and grave taken from us? Someone had to speak out for the families. My cousin, a tough, hardened policeman, could not. 
he called me and said, I'm handing it over to you. I can't do this anymore. So for the last 12 or 13 years, I taught myself to hold back the emotion as best I can and talk about it. Because someone had to speak for the families of those police officers. I joined the Blue Ribbon Foundation and I started to meet others who had those same sad eyes as my grandfather. We were not alone, but whoever I talked to said, you, the Kennedys and Lonigans have it harder than us because the person who murdered your police officer has been turned into a hero, an unjustified hero. We've had to object to the Kelly name being put on the police monument in Mansfield. We've had to object to the police tree that you can see my family when I was a little bit younger and had slightly more red hair, um, being, having its name changed from the police tree to the Kelly tree. We had to fight and I led the fight for Stringy Bark Creek to be put on the correct side of the creek and establish an historically accurate walking trail that takes you to as best as we can divine where the police camped, where McIntyre escaped to, where Sergeant Kennedy ran until he was captured and finally murdered. And I did all this from historical records. The same records that are quoted in many of those 110 books. The thing that struck me most when I was asked to write a book about the person I at least wanted to write a book about, Ned Kelly, was how many people wrote whatever they felt like, and then put a reference to something that said the opposite. It made me more determined to tell the real story. It made me more determined, good, bad or indifferent of the police and or the Kellys to get the story right and to tell it truly. So over two years while I was also working on the Stringy Bar Creek presentation, I wrote a book. It started out as a love story, the story of Michael and Bridget that I excitedly took to the publishers and naively took to the publishers, but they wanted me to write about Ned. But in the end, I suppose you ended up with two, th three stories in one. The story of Michael and Bridget, the story of the spiral out of control of Ned Kelly, but also the story afterwards of how my family dealt with it and tried to take back our real story. And there were two things driving me the whole time. One was to get this story right for my grandpa, Jimmy and my dad. And the other is what could I leave my grandchildren when I'm blessed with them? I did not want to be a grandpa with the saddest eyes they'd ever seen. Thank you. Look, thank you, Leo. Look, what we've heard tonight is just a tiny part of the overall story. I must admit, and it is included in the book, and there is much more in the book. But uh, it's interesting. Um, we have a Q and A session there, so if anyone has any questions, down in the bottom centre of their screens. There's a Q&A button. If you have a question, please uh, put a question in there and ask it. But Leo, you, you talked several times about a uh, historian that seems to have got it wrong. Are you able to uh, expand on that? Um, there's been, I guess, a number of historians or writers that have got it wrong. Um, 
one that, that I grew up with and uh, he was very influential in developing the Kelly Trail was a man who's now deceased called Ian Jones. He seemed to take the Gerildry letter and try and turn it into fact, but that was his first mistake. Uh, the Gerildry letter was correctly described by Inspector Hare as a tissue of lies. And it was. Um, as I was writing the book, I actually went through the Gerildry letter and put it, put columns there and had Ned said and what actually happened. Um, I'll give you just one example of where um, Dean Jones takes the story of, of Ned and how uh, he, he dealt with um, Mr. and Mrs. McCormick and uh, Mr. McCormick's face meeting Ned's fist. It wasn't true. What Ned belted that man and his wife with was a stirrup iron. He rode into their camp with a stirrup iron flailing on its bit of leather and belted this man and this woman around the head. Um, Ian Jones turned um, the, the selector, witty, into a squatter. He wasn't a squatter. He was a selector. He was a clever selector that bought a farm and his daughter and his son bought a farm and they farmed together and then they made a living, put money together and bought another selection and another selection. They were successful, clever farmers. Ned didn't like him because he put up fences to keep his cattle in and try and keep horse thieves out. Okay. Um, Leo, can I just ask a question for the benefit of the audience? Can you explain the difference between a selector and a squatter? Okay. Um, so when Victoria started up and they wanted to uh, get the colony going, they first of all people went out into the land and took up illegal squats, and then later the government uh, found out who who was where and started to charge them a fee for that land and then started to actually grant out squatting licenses over land. So th this would be hundreds, if not thousands of acres, um, unfenced and cattle, livestock roaming uh, or market gardens set up and they would use uh, imported labor from China to do the market gardening. Those were your squatters. Um, after the, after the gold rush, when you had this massive explosion of people from a, a colony of 50,000 up to half a million in just a, a 10 or so years, um, after the gold rush, what do you do with all these people? Where are they going to go? They can't really go back to Ireland or Scotland or wherever else they came from. So the government decided 80 acres was the perfect size to farm, no matter what. So they went to certain areas, did this, did their surveying, decided this land is suitable for farming and you could apply for a selection. What that meant was that over time, as you paid for your, your um, fees on your selection each year, the government was receiving this steady flow of income. So instead of rates or taxes or anything else, this was how apart from gold, this was how Victoria was funding itself through these sales and these year on year payments down on land. So over time, over a period of, the, they nominated 10 years, they, they estimated you would be able to work, uh, do a, an allocated amount of clearing and eventually clear your selection, uh, meet all the requirements, pay it off and you would be granted freehold title of your selection. So that's how you ended up being a landowner. Um, Alan Kelly, for example, um, took twice, if not three times as long to pay off her selection. It's very strange since uh, one of her sons or her sons were making so much money out of horse theft, but they never appeared to put any money towards paying off their mother's selection. And again, too, there were, uh, if you did have a case of hardship, they would extend your time. So it maybe didn't take 10 years, it may take 15.
Right, All right, Leo. Look, Jane has some questions that have come in on the QAS session, so I'll hand over to Jane for that. Thanks, Leo. I must say that personally I'm um, very moved by this very tragic story and ignorantly of myself, I haven't ever bothered to delve further other than I always thought he was a bad guy, but I just didn't realise how rottenly bad he actually was. So um, I've got a number of questions here, a couple of them tie in together, but the first one that um, uh, we've been asked is why do you think the Kelly gang, gang is actually glorified? Well, part of it, I think, is, again, how they're portrayed. Um, if you think of, I suppose, the, the Aussie battler, the person battling authority, um, the person who's, I suppose, victimised by this oppressive um, government or government agency, that seems to hold some sort of credit with, with a number of people. Um, you know, Ned is portrayed as the victim and the little guy with these bad guy police. So if you, and again, this sort of fitted in with the, I suppose, slotting the Ned Kelly story into the, I suppose, the, the Hollywood playbook. So many Hollywood movies have that uh, situation of the hero is the, the downtrodden, hardworking guy who um, the authorities have picked on. And so he, he turns bad and tries to justify uh, what he's doing and, and eventually snaps. So there is, there is that element. And again, too, it's um, interesting all the, the different ways Ned's been represented, either in books or even, even cartoons um, and playbooks to children growing up. Uh, it's always around um, you know, Ned being the central character uh, as distinct from um, in other societies such as Canada, um, the Mounties are the heroes. In the US, the sheriffs are the heroes. But strangely, here in Australia, and I don't know whether it's got something to do with uh, how many convicts landed here or what, um, it's the someone who's the, the son of the convict. But also, if you think to that armour, that audacious armour, it was so striking and it's been used as such a symbol. But what intrigued me was was badly planned and it was their downfall. No one's actually really sat down, I think, before me and studied it and worked out that, hang on a minute, this was such a badly concocted idea. They actually trapped themselves, brought themselves undone, and it was the destruction of them. But it's celebrated as some iconic piece of piece of art almost. And again, too, there's another place where it did play out was in art. Um, suddenly you had the that painting series um, where the Nolan series where it featured this Ned Kelly. So cartoon-like, harmless, uh, and I refer back to uh, Ian Jones and now um, you've got Peter Fitzsimons with this, uh, you know, bad boy Ned, uh, victim Ned, um, whitewashing uh, all the bad things he did um, and turning the hostage situations into parties. Mm. You read about in their books about the hostages having a good time and dancing and drinking. Whereas when you read the news reports, teenagers were forced to drink by these men standing over them drink until they fell down. That is not how it is portrayed by the Joneses and the Fitzsimons. So I guess um, to follow on from that question, um, do you think that people really believe the true Ned Kelly story or is the legend more powerful? Um, I don't see how the legend is more powerful because the legend is so inconsistent. Uh, and it's taken in so many different ways. Um, and then the latest is um, uh, them getting around in dresses in, in all their most, uh, I suppose, violent moments. Uh, how can you treat that seriously? Um, and again, too, when, whenever you go back to 
the original documents uh, such as I did, because I grew up with family stories but wanted to verify them. So I went to um, primary records and matched up. Now well, this is what my dad told me. What does the primary record say? Well, it says that. Um, if you take any of those other books, whether it's uh, Keyses or Fitzsimons or Joneses, and then go to the primary records, you will spot where they have written myth. They have taken, they've gone away from the real story. Uh, and the other thing I take heart in is Kelly descendants and Lloyd descendants have thanked me for writing this book. Thanked me for setting the record straight and being fair about it and the impacts on their families as well. Um, they grew up tough, the, the nieces and the nephews of Ned Kelly and their descendants. They were pariahs to society because of the sins of Ned Kelly. Somehow that's been forgotten, but not in the, those families. Their names were blackened by Ned. That they, and, and they do not like how, for example, the, the Kurzel movie treats and portrays Alan Kelly uh, or the others in the movie. They do not like what Ian Jones has written about their family members because it is not correct. It is not accurate. A number of elements of my book were sourced from Kelly gang descendants mm. or associates because I was determined to get it right. I was determined to be balanced uh, and present it as real as possible. And I couldn't even use the word true story because Peter Carey had written a novel that he called the true story of Ned Kelly when it was a myth made up because he decided they'd got that out of hand. He could write whatever he likes and call it true because it, it didn't matter anymore. But I can tell you, it certainly matters to my family and it certainly matters to Kelly descendants that I know. So hopefully truth will overcome myth. Yes, often don't let the truth get in the way of a good story. That's right. Um, before we throw back to Adrian, I'd just like to read you a couple of the comments that have come through. Thank you for a wonderful presentation. Um, excellent presentation. I feel privileged to have been educated about the truth as I have, like so many other, believed the opposite. So I think that you've done um, a great job with this audience and hopefully you can now tell us how we might be able to obtain a copy of The Black Snake to read the detail of um, what seems like a lifetime of um, <laughs> investigation and research and primary sourcing and um, it's amazing. I admire your passion. Well, thank you very much for that and uh, well, that was one of the things too. I, I made sure everything I stated in the book had a reference. So there's um, out of a manuscript that was 135,000 words and over 630 references. Uh, you can get a book that's got 422 of those references and uh, not everything I initially wrote because um, it was too big for the, the publisher. Um, the easiest way in these COVID times um, is to go to Booktopia uh, and it's there on screen and um, I presume Adrian Rotary might be able to provide uh, these links to people. Um, if you're interested in an e-book uh, or an audio book, um, they're available uh, on Amazon. Thank you. Um, I'm sure that Adrian will give the public image people the appropriate information so that it can be disseminated. And also, um, I'd like you to know and the attendees present that a recording will be available of this webinar. And um, we hope that many people that weren't able to attend tonight will take advantage of um, learning a whole lot like we did tonight. So thank you so much. Um, thank you, Adrian. Thank you. Very much. Thank you. Thank you, Joan. Um, look, uh, because I've been close to the story for so long and known Leo for so long, what we've seen is just a tiny part of the whole story, but it is included in the book. 
So, uh, look, I, I would recommend people have a look at the book. It is thoroughly researched. It is appropriately uh, referenced to uh, confirm that the uh, resources of the information are solid. I tell you what, uh, Ned Kelly wasn't a nice guy. And uh, over history, we've seen him rehabilitated to the point where he's a bit of a folk hero. But I tell you what, he wasn't. He was not a good guy. And uh, I, I recommend to all of you, you have a look at that. And uh, to Leo for your presentation tonight, thank you so much. I really wanted to have that in front of our conference, but, you know, COVID-19 conspired against us, but uh, we do hope. Uh, and we know that a lot of people who have not um, viewed tonight on live, we know a lot of people are really interested in seeing the recording of this. So uh, let's hope it helps get the message out there. And uh, yeah, it, it has a whole new story. Now, what I would mention is with Leo, I have been up to uh, Stringy Bark Creek. Uh, we were up there with the uh, Commissioner of Police when they reopened the uh, Stringy Bark Creek uh, um, area there and uh, they changed a lot of the things because the history had incorrectly been recorded. So it's now been mostly fixed up. Look, if anyone goes to Mansfield, wants to go up to Stringy Bark Creek uh, on the road toward Whitfield and hang a left, I recommend you do so. Very fascinating place. And uh, Leo, again, thank you very much. Loved your presentation and uh, let's hope uh, people over time are gonna see Ned Kelly for who he really was. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Adrian, and thank you, Rotary, for the opportunity. I really appreciate it, and uh, I wish you well. Thank you.